Welcome to Revolting News. Tooley and Peter Lamborn Wilson discuss the emergence of the state from the Paleolithic Hunter-Gatherer Society. Uh, today we have uh, with us one of our frequent and admired guests, Peter Lamborn Wilson, anarchist scholar, raconteur, poet, uh, WBAI uh, columnist, and author, author. Oh. Uh, uh, yes, my new book here, you plug it. Let's see, it's, uh, <laughs> this is the first time I've seen it. Sacred Drift, Essays on the Margins of Islam. Published by City Lights. Get, you're getting some uh, reflections there. But th No, published that's the mystic part of it. I like that. Published by City Lights, I'm very proud to say. Nice cover. And the cover is by James Conline. Nice also, cover. Also and it's available, the, right? Yeah, it's available. Uh, your, your show goes to downtown Manhattan mostly. And uptown, too, now. Well, anyway, it's, it's at St. Mark's Books. That, I, uh -huh. that much I can tell you for sure. And, uh, and then the, a, the, a new review. review the, 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 this issue will be out by the time you see this show. It's it like BLS. A nice photo. By, yeah, by the in the Voice Literary Supplement. A nice uh, article by Eric Davis. And uh, you're also uh, one of the uh, movers at the Libertarian Book Club. You move the books. <laughs> <laughs> movers and shakers. <laughs> <laughs> And they meet? Uh, we, uh, well, we meet, uh, but we have uh, forums. Forums. Yeah, mo right. monthly forums. And, and uh, like, for example, I, the next one is going to be on the cypherpunk movement. I'm afraid. All right. Uh, uh, is there a number? That I can't even get. Just before, uh, just the after. Eighth? The 8th? I don't think this news. will be aired before then. But, um, right. But However, the 22nd. But you'll catch on. Uh, if you want to, uh, is anyone ever at uh, at uh, Lafayette Street? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, or at least there's a, a phone message, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, but, uh, right, the phone, I guess, would be your best contact for that. Okay, so... Libertarian Book Club, which means, in our mind, anarchist, uh, and not Libertarian Party. We always have to right, say that. yeah. Uh, that, that word used to mean anarchist, and it was sort of copped by the Libertarian yeah. Party. Well, they believe in stealing, if you can get yeah, it. Yeah, right. From, the, you, from you, the poor, I think. Well, Whereas anarchists really just believe in taking from the rich. Right. That's what we were That's the like difference, actually, anyway. between the two groups, I think. Well, uh, my friend Robert Anton Wilson always said that he could never quite bring himself to join the Libertarian Party because he didn't hate poor people enough. But, uh, yeah, I think a Libertarian is someone who believes that if you manufacture, make a gun by yourself, all by yourself, then you have a right to hold people up. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not actually so, uh, I, I don't stand uh, opposed to uh, right wing, well, whatever you want to call it, libertarian yeah. party, libertarianism. I don't agree with it, but on the other hand, we were talking earlier about yeah. the possibility of a united front with other for yeah. example, uh, libertarian Marxists yeah. or, or people on the left who are at least uh, willing to uh, discuss the idea of freedom or, or non-authoritarian structure. Yeah. And I find that uh, the libertarians, capital L libertarians, are uh, within that board, well, within you know, that freedom, boundary. From, from freedom me. to do what? Well, freedom to persecute other well, people because, well, to I exploit said, other people. No, look, because I'm not going to defend their position, okay. Tully. I'm just saying that if we're going to talk about a united front, uh, then um, uh, I can, I can uh, see the possibility of uh, cooperating in certain political situations. On with, issues yeah. to worry. With, um, yeah, well, I mean, I would cooperate with a fascist in a sinking, uh, if I was on a sinking boat. You no, know. this is, uh, it's not quite what I mean. It's, um, we'll get to that, don't worry. There are, there, there are anarchists who want to remain so ideologically pure that, uh, that they, by definition, condemn uh, the, uh, the possibility of realizing any uh, real anarchism in the real world to, uh, to uh, futility and, uh, and and yeah no I'm I don't think I'm one of those pipe dreaming no I don't think you are either but uh, I, you're a left wing anarchist if if I could you're an anarcho communist wouldn't you say you're a I would say that right? yeah so 
uh, most of the people I know in that category just can't bear the libertarians. You know, they won't have anything to do with them. And I think that could possibly be a tactical error. That's all I'm saying. Wow. Just, just the way I know a lot of individualists who just can't, uh, they can't even bear the word Marxism. They won't read Marx. They won't use any Marxist categories. Uh, even when, even when, in fact, in, on some points, after all, some uh, Marxist thinking uh, is, in fact, uh, not only uh, com uh, not only uh, sharper than uh, an uh, Marxist economics is not only right. sharper than anarchist economics. Right. It's also compatible with anarchism. I agree with. You. I mean, even Marx himself talked about the withering of the state. You know, uh, theoretically, it's compa there's a compatibility there. Yeah, and, well, I uh, try to be very I, libertarian. I tell you, I'd rather see the Libertarian Party in power in America than the Republicans or the Democrats. That would uh, be a step forward. It's I not going to. It's not going to happen. So you know. I don't know if it would be a step forward. A I step sideways. Be. I think it would be because uh, their commitment to. Um, individual freedoms would make it possible for more people to work for economic freedom. And then they would wipe out any benefits that the so-called so well, benefits that the state does give As soon as they got into power, yeah, of course. Are informing the people of what we were going to talk about? Today? Oh, we forgot what we wanted to no, talk about. No, no, we're going to talk about it, but this was more interesting than what we're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, so, okay, folks, you can forget about the... All right. Uh, Speaking of liber uh, lectures at the Libertarian Book Club, uh, I missed a lecture on uh, Peter, the uh, lecture on the uh, the state, origins and uh, future of the state, right? I don't know. Well, it was actually just on the anthropological uh, um, view of the, uh, the origin of the state. Okay. And, uh, so, and, and uh, certain economic and social uh, Changes that could best be tracked by uh, by, by anthropology or, or ethno history. Okay, is there any uh, just to get this out of the way? I've become interested in uh, primate social organization, which is a blooming confusion because uh, there isn't a direct. Obviously, there's no direct. There isn't a direct physical descent that we've been able to prove, and there's no direct so, uh, certainly social uh, organization. If you, if indeed human society has a uh, you're questioning the has, has primate a, connections? Has, oh, no, there are connections, but um, what they reveal, I think, are possibilities, and I think mm. that, and, and, and the human species sort of is, uh, has the physical possibilities, I think, to have many, many different kinds of social organizations. Mm. We can see that ranging from torture and fascism to some kind of idyllic uh, utopia, which has existed in different times and places, even in our lifetime. Well, so uh, you begin wherever you want. If if this, well, I would like if you want to talk primate organization. If you if there is that data or if you have it, it's not one of the things I know a lot about. But well, then what about there's, well? All right, obviously, family, there's, a, there's a there's a very long gray period between a, a, a primate and and human. In other words, uh, if if we can accept uh, at least that much uh, evolutionary doctrine. And I think it's um, you know it's pretty clear. So what are we talking that about as far as humans? I mean, well, that's that's million, what I'm saying. We don't million? know. We don't know. That's what I'm saying. Oh, we don't know. Is. You can look at uh, look at this particular uh, ape-like creature and hypothesize that it's on a direct line of evolution t to uh, Homo sap, or, or that it's not. But nobody knows for sure. I mean, the leakies come out and make very bold statements about what's going on, but they don't. You know, it's not for sure. What's for sure is that there's this immense gray area. And as, as, uh, as human beings emerge little by little and, and in, in very you know, controversial ways out of that gray area, um, you can begin to make uh, certain hypotheses about what, what differenti differentiates human society from animal society. And once again, the, uh, the, the differentiation would be would be very gray. It would not be a, a black is there, differentiation. Is there a history of the family that uh, history of the state precedes that we know anything about? Um, well, I don't know if I'd quite or put groupings it groupings of other kind of. What about the pre-state grouping? The, That's what you're going to talk about, I guess. Or you you start where you, you would want to. Well, what I, as far as the family goes, when nowadays when when we use the word family. 
uh, what immediately comes yeah, to mind is our current the, model yeah, of the, the family. Uh, nuclear the, the nuclear the, the Bush versus right. Yeah, okay, the family good. values, that right. kind of the thing. Nuclear the family. nuclear family is not the only model of of of, of uh, organization. And may not have been the earlier model. For humans the who model. are blood related. Yeah, uh, right. I don't think it was the earliest right. model. Okay. Um, the uh, the assumption that it was the earliest model is a kind of lingering mythological uh, hangover from the Bible. Right. Uh, if you study um, so-called primitive societies, uh, you'll find a, a plethora, you know, a wide range of possible models for human organization. And the point that I be began well, my lecture. for child raising, which is which is what the family is supposed absolutely. to. Absolutely. And the point, the point that uh, the point that I began uh, making in my lecture is that there are many. Uh, if you read hist historians on the subject of anarchism, you will hear it said that there has never been an anarchist, uh, a successful anarchist society. Which historians? Uh, any Lanning wants you to look at the camera. Any yeah. historians, you know. We're over here in the living room. All right, I can't help uh, talking to Thule. He's so magnetic. Um, <laughs> Reverse the polarity. <laughs> um, the uh, if you say anarchism as an ideology, then this would be true. Uh, you know, there was Barcelona, there was the Ukraine, there were there there are some fascinating communes like Brook Farm and the others that we love to talk about. But none of them lasted very long. None of them uh, kicked off the revolution or the evolution that they dreamed of kicking off. And you could, in a sense, accuse all of these uh, modern experiments of being, in some way, failures. However, if you're talking about anarchy as opposed to anarchism, right, a state of being in which there is no, no state, a, 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 a means of human organization which does not include the state, then you could say that uh, human beings lived in a state of anarchy for 99.99% of our existence as a species. In other words, up until the emergence of the Neolithic, about 10, 12,000 years ago, there was no state. Well, there was organization. Now, how would you distinguish there was organization. a state, a state there was certainly from the organization. previous organization? Um, Is it its authority or... I would say the the gist of it is separation. Um, the separation uh, in the sense of, of specialization of labor to a certain ex extent, um, separation uh, on the basis of a gender polarity. But and wait, if and, I, if and wait a minute, let me finish my thought. And separation on the basis of class, which comes originally from a separation between scarcity and surplus. Now, if you, uh, if you read the works of, um, did you ever read um, Stone Age Economics by Marshall Salins? No. All right. In Stone Age Economics, uh, the anthropologist Marshall Salins, who's a great uh, How do you thinker, spell it? S-A-H-L-I-N-S. Um, it's in the library, huh? Oh, yeah. It's, it's not, unfortunately, not in print, but it's certainly in the library. There, um, he, uh, he wanted to uh, study the idea that um, primitive man, as they used to call it in anthropological circles, uh, lived a, a nasty, brutish, and short life, and that civilization has brought us great benefits of longer life and better, uh, you know, more happiness, uh, more security, and so forth and so on. So he did a statistical analysis of all the hunter-gatherer tribes that he could find in the world today. Um, with the proviso that these tribes have been pushed out to the very margin of sustainability. And we're talking about Bushmen, Aborigines, Pygmies, Eskimos, people who are basically still hunter-gatherers because they live in parts of the world that uh, the um, uh, capitalism or, or other evolved economies can't use and don't want. Uh, so <clears throat> If, these if, if you found that these people, for example, had to work uh, 14 hours a day uh, to get their food, you could assume that hunters in, in France in the Ice Age would have had to work less, right? Because it would have been a richer ecology and uh, they would have had uh, um, um, a better balance with their ecology. So, in fact, what Salins found was that the existing hunter-gatherer societies that he could study 
work an average of 4.2 hours a day. Uh, this, these figures are, you know, you can argue with them on certain bases, but anyway. The 28-hour week. He, he, laid, he laid it out, uh, how he arrived at these statistics. You can follow his methodology, and it's been pretty, pretty much widely accepted now that, uh, that, that, that he's right and that um, he coined the term the original leisure society to refer to hunter-gatherers and especially the hunter-gatherers of the ice age and the, the paleolithic um, and uh, by comparison with early agriculturalists uh, primitive agriculturalists let's say of the slash and burn variety uh, he found had to work from 12 to 14 hours a day on the average another interesting point that he discovered is that these existing hunter-gatherer societies have a larder uh, of foodstuffs that averages 200 items. And the uh, primitive agriculturalists have a larder of foodstuffs that averages 20, one-tenth. Are they so, able to preserve? Uh, so his point was that in a, in a, hunt, in a hunting society, if uh, a, a blight or a famine hits one part of the economy, there are plenty of other parts. In fact, there's a wonderful statement that's often quoted by an African bushman who, says, who said to an anthropologist, why should we till the earth when there are so many magongo nuts? You know? <laughs> and, uh, that's a good is, question. It's a very, very yeah. good question. Why should agriculture have arisen? There's no economic reason. Well, for isn't it, isn't it uh, the, the problem of uh, preser uh, preserving food in a... In a in a case of scarcity or catastrophe. Well, uh, Salins, of course, uh, had to investigate that hypothesis. And he found that um, early agricultural societies are much more frequently overtaken by uh, disaster, the disaster of because scarcity. They're dependent on because they're dependent on single one crops. Crop. Mm -hmm. Uh, you put all your eggs in one basket. If the if eggs, if there, you know, if there's an egg yeah. blight, you're screwed. And is you there, know, uh, whereas if you can go and eat uh, uh, magongo nuts or witchetty grubs, uh, then then you're okay. You get, you're going to get, you're gonna get by. Also. They it's have a very disease. They have a varied diet. They practice birth control. Uh, they stay in balance with their ecology. There is no, I mean, there are many explanations of why agriculture arose, and I don't find any of them satisfactory. So do the... Uh, and neither did Salins. Do the hunter-gatherers have means, do they, for instance, do they have pottery? Do they have means of, of saving, and do they live in settled uh, communities? Um, less so, obviously, than agriculturalists. Uh -huh. but, uh, uh, but they're not, they're not uh, condemned to wander, blah, blah, blah. Do you they know? Ha did they have pottery? Look, think about living in the Dordogne in France in, uh, in the, you know, uh -huh. um, uh, 12,000 Did they live in caves, too, then? Yeah. They lived in caves. They lived in huts. You know, they lived in, in, in trees, for all I know. Um, they, but they clearly lived quite well. So the cave uh, paintings were hunter and gatherers in the southern Absolutely, France? yeah. That's and then they, then they would have places to store stuff, Listen, right? The, those paintings, this is a very important point. Those paintings disappeared when agriculture began slowly to emerge. Uh, art. art disappeared when agriculture began to emerge. Those were the no yuppies time. of they the. Uh, they didn't. They have, were the yuppies of that they, of they their time. Very likely didn't have time for it. I think that would be a fair guess. The proto yuppies. There may be other reasons for the disappearance disappearance of the great cave art, but. Uh, well, maybe they, the agriculturists might not live have lived near grave near cave. Uh, yeah, but history is the environment. History they would want to live in. They would want to live in. They would want to live in valleys. They would want to live in valleys. The point, no, well, right, let, me, let me make a very important point about the hunters, which is that uh, they do not live in authoritarian societies in, uh, in which a state exists. That is to say, first of all, there's no class differentiation amongst the hunters, and there are no permanent authority figures. This is a universal. Unless a hunter tribe has been uh, "quote unquote" corrupted by contact with uh, other uh, uh, forms of economy, as in as much as anybody can tell, this holds true for the entire Paleolithic, just as it holds true for the hunter societies that we've been able to study scientifically since the the, uh, the 19th century, which is not a very long time, admittedly. Um, can you make any judgment about the ratio of? Uh I imagine this would be very hard to do, and uh, 
between the ratio of gathering to hunting? Oh, you know, it's not hard to do. Uh, gathering is always, almost always more important. Um, the hunting has prestige in hunting societies. It's gathering that, that, that uh, fills and the, the women do the gathering. The women do the gathering. Now, this is one, ex one interesting explanation for why agriculture could possibly have arisen. Dig this. This is fascinating. Dig this agricultural explanation? This is the gender explanation. Okay. All right? Um, the gender explanation says women gather, men hunt. Suddenly the ice age comes along. What happens? Much more animal food is much more important now than the tubers and the roots and the berries, right? Uh, so there's a, suddenly the men have a preponderance of economic power. And um, you get a hypothetical, some sort of patriarchy hypothetically. Then the women revolt against it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they invent agriculture out of their knowledge of gathering in order to try to redress the power balance with the men. And they're so successful that agriculture wins the battle. And what you get is the hypothetical uh, Neolithic matriarchy that people like Maria Gimbutas talk about um, and think is a very good thing. Now it doesn't. Now, now it begins to look a little ambiguous when you if, when you realize that agriculture and the state are twins. If if women are responsible for agriculture, then women are responsible for the state. Frankly, I don't dig. I, I don't. Uh, I don't accept you, this theory. Then wouldn't there, shouldn't there have been uh, women rulers then? Well, the there hypothesis. were. There were, mm -hmm. or at least that's the Gimbutas hypothesis. Uh, well, women heads of state. You have that yeah. now. Yeah. It isn't very good, though. <laughs> it doesn't work out that well. Well, <coughs> the... Um, I mean, I, they're, I they're not any better... They're, they're not any, be they're not any better than men, is all I'm saying. I don't think it's... Uh, I don't think it's, it's not irrelevant, but uh, this couldn't possibly be the sole explanation for the rise of agriculture in the state. The no, I'm saying Maggie Thatcher is no different than... The war between the sexes just doesn't Churchill do it. Churchill or Major or any of those states. Another explanation for the rise of agriculture, and hence the rise of the state, is, is climate, and, uh, which hypothesizes that the hunting life becomes much more difficult and that people begin to worry about um, uh, a scarcity. But I don't believe this either. I think that agriculture creates scarcity. Um, the hunters don't have any concept of scarcity or surplus. It's not part of their economic thinking. They're not a commodity-driven society. Uh, they practice what uh, anthropology calls the economy of the gift, of reciprocity, which does not involve money. It's not the same thing as barter, uh, and it certainly is not, uh, it has nothing to do with, uh, with excess and, and scarcity. Um, well, I want to make a correction here. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want to I want to uh, I want to correct my flippant statement about women. The fact that there were some women leaders who uh, have become just like men doesn't mean that necessarily that uh, a society where where women uh, had more prominence or more power wouldn't be different from. Uh, well, we, from what men what men would do, we could but, hard, we hardly know know what it is because we don't have any right. examples to look right. at. That's so the problem. I, I, so we would have some, to leave that open. There are some societies which are nowadays are a bit more matriarchal than others. You could look at some uh, southern Indian societies where women are very powerful, or Tibet, for example. But they're not matriarchies. We d we really don't have a histor in the historical era. We don't have a matriarchy to look at and study, mm -hmm. and see whether we would like it better than a patriarchy. We only know the patriarchal model basically. So, um, in fact, all the women leaders that you're talking about are fitting themselves into a patriarchal model, exactly, right. and therefore usually end up uh, worse. Yeah, in some they respect. have to prove themselves. They have, yeah, they got to be more. You know. They got to have more chutzpah than the mensch, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, they they end up being a little, you know. In Thatcher, you know, is much far scarier than a lot of, uh, well, you know, that argument. So anyway, uh, the the point is that all the all the models for the emergence of the state don't make any sense, in my opinion. And and uh, I'm not saying this to be smart. I'm admitting that I don't understand where authority comes from. It doesn't seem to be natural 
Uh, it doesn't seem to be organic. Uh, it certainly doesn't appear until very, very late in the human story. Uh, 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 it it's only occupies the last few seconds of the tick-tock of, of, of history. All right, but what about, let's go and, back uh, to... It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a mystery. It's go, really a mystery. Go back to the primates. Uh, a lot of the primate species... Well, maybe next show, have, we're almost wrapping up. Have, These how shows many are times? too short. We've got a couple of minutes. Oh, we're going to... But a lot of... I mean, there is a root in biology. A lot of uh, primates, uh, there's primate dominance. It's generally male dominance. But... Uh, but we're, we're a peculiar, the humans are peculiar primates and, and that I think they can surpass, uh, they don't have to follow, uh, or their biology is so complex and, and varied that we, we, we can do a lot of things that uh, gorillas and chimpanzees uh, have less choice about. Yeah, I don't think we should accept any kind of uh, uh, biological determinism about our society. No, but we that, have, there is a root in... in uh, we, have in, a, we have imagination. In most primate species for this kind of dominance, which we don't have to accept. They also tear... Uh, and it's discovered, for instance, that gorillas or chimpanzees tear uh, small monkeys apart and eat them raw. We don't have to do that either. We no. cook them. <laughs> no, we don't have to. Cooking is very bad, actually. You know, the human <coughs> human uh, biology develop, human physiology developed with raw food. That's that's probably, true. That's probably true. And in yeah. fact, um, my hypothesis is that although this is not at all accepted by the anthropologists, that gathering would precede hunting uh, in terms of development. So that uh, I, I would hypothesize that the original human society was a gender egalitarian gathering society and, he, and the future well, we evolved on and the future society for the most part, right? uh, well I, I, most, I don't know yeah I don't more know. vegetarian the, than people the, well met. the anthropologists don't agree to it you know they talk about meat-eating primates that's what we're supposed to be well no no it's both I think but we have a choice I think that that's the main thing is that we now have a culture uh, right. Culture is our nature, and, and culture is essentially imagination. And we are capable of imagining all these models, um, whether we're capable of living them or not. Oh, not yeah, we're capable of living. We're going to continue living, I think, at least until the next show. 40 more seconds. We have 40 more seconds. Now, in the next, sh next and future show, we're going to continue uh, discussing uh, the state. Since in our earlier series of programs we never got out of the 19th century, sure. I figured we might as well go back to the Stone Yeah, we're, we're going back. Our aim is to get up to the 19th century again. <laughs> <laughs> so see you next week, folks. See you in the Paleolithic. Button up. But, and then what else?